Welcome to uh, this deep dive into Schopenhauer. You've been digging into this whole world of rhetoric and philosophy, right? Spe specifically, like Schopenhauer's views on logic, arguments, and you know just what it means to be human. Yeah, he doesn't hold back, does he? Not at all. So to really get into it, we're looking at excerpts from a few of his works. We've got The Art of Controversy, some of his psychological observations, and even a little bit from On the Comparative Place of Interest and Beauty in Works of Art. Quite the lineup. It is. So to kick things off, I think it's worth unpacking Schopenhauer's concept of logic versus dialectic, or what he sometimes calls heuristic. What exactly is he getting at when he separates these things out? It's a distinction that trips a lot of people up for sure. Imagine like logic as this pure search for truth, a set of rules for thinking clearly and without bias, you know? Okay, it makes sense. But then you have dialectic, which in Schopenhauer's world is more about the art of winning an argument. It's less about the truth and more about the strategies you use to come out on top, even if it means, you know, bending the rules a little. And that's where art heuristic comes in. It's the sneakier side of argumentation. And to make it even more complicated, the ancient Greeks, they practically thought logic and dialectic were the same thing. It took Kant to really give dialectic that like negative spin. Huh, interesting. It's kind of like when you're arguing with someone yeah. and in your gut, <laughs> you know you're right but they're so good at twisting things around that you get flustered. It's almost like they're more interested in being right than in actually finding out the truth of the matter. Schopenhauer nailed it when he said, that's a huge reason why arguments go nowhere. We're so driven by vanity, we'd rather cling to our precious opinions, even when we suspect they might be wrong, than just admit defeat. It's so true. Have you ever noticed how hard it is to admit you're wrong, even just to yourself? Absolutely, Schopenhauer said it best. For human nature is such that if A and B are engaged in thinking in common, as soon as they cease to agree, A perceives that. The mistake has occurred in B's thinking. Like we're wired to assume the other person messed up, even when we're the ones who went off track. So if we're all so busy trying to be right, how can we ever have a productive conversation, let alone actually resolve a disagreement? Are we doomed to just argue in circles forever? It's the age-old question, right? Schopenhauer doesn't exactly hand us a simple solution, but he does offer some really insightful observations about how art plays into all of this. And this is where things get pretty interesting. Okay, now I'm intrigued. Tell me more about Schopenhauer's ideas about interest versus beauty in art. What's that all about? So for Schopenhauer, true art, like the real deal, it's all about beauty. And beauty, for him, comes from the clear expression of an idea. Interest has its place, but it's definitely a secondary thing. So a truly beautiful work of art should make you think like make you see an idea in a new way rather than just being entertaining. Exactly. It should engage your intellect, not just rely on like a gripping plot or something to keep you hooked. Which is where interest comes in, I guess, right? Like a book can be super interesting, keep you up all night because you got to know what happens next, but it might not be something you'd call high art. Exactly. And Schopenhauer uses this really unexpected example to show the difference. Wax figures. Wax figures. What do those have to do with art and philosophy? Well, he uses them to illustrate how too much realism, while initially fascinating, can actually detract from the true beauty of art. Think about when you see a really lifelike wax figure. There's that wow factor, that is it real moment. That's what Schopenhauer means by interest. But that focus on is it real or not can actually stop you from appreciating the artistry, the craft behind it. It's like the difference between being entertained by a story and being deeply moved by a piece of art. They're both powerful in their own way. And it's that distinction between interest and beauty, Schopenhauer argues, that explains why we might be drawn to certain works, even if deep down we're like, this isn't exactly profound. It's the hook, the interest that gets us, even if it's not speaking to our deeper selves. That guilty pleasure movie you watch a hundred times, maybe. You got it. It might not be high art, but it's okay. enjoyable. And Schopenhauer gives us a way to understand why we like what we like, even if it's not, you know, winning any awards. So is he saying we should, like, ditch all interesting art and only focus on the beautiful stuff? Not necessarily. He actually thought a little bit of interest can be a good thing, especially when it comes to literature. Like, think of interest as the hook that draws you in, then the deeper meaning unfolds as you go along. So it's about balance, finding that sweet spot between interest and beauty. Exactly. Being aware of how those two things are working within a piece of art, that's what allows us to appreciate it on a deeper level. Wow, this is giving me a whole new way to look at, like, everything I read and watch 
I might need to rethink my entire bookshelf. See, that's Schopenhauer for you. He makes you question everything and see things from a fresh perspective. And honestly, we're just scratching the surface here. He has a lot to say about human nature, about how our minds work. And that is exactly what we are going to dive into next. When we get into Schopenhauer's psychological observations, that's where we really see him like dissect human nature. He had this knack for putting his finger on our quirks, you know, our flaws, those little things that make us tick. Yeah. It's almost uncomfortable how relatable he could be. Like how he talks about that deep down we're all kind of self-centered, even when we're going through tough times. Absolutely. He was really onto something with this whole idea that as humans, we crave validation from others, especially when things are rough. It's almost like when something bad happens, we want the whole world to stop and feel sorry for us. Exactly. He talks about this primal need to make our suffering the center of attention, as if by having others acknowledge our pain, it somehow lessens it. And when they don't, we either lash out or, like, try to force them to listen, even if they're not really present. The irony is we crave this genuine connection, but our own egos get in the way. Schopenhauer suggests that this is a big part of why it's so hard to have truly meaningful conversations. Because instead of really listening to understand, we're too busy trying to, like, manage their impression of us or prove our own points. Exactly. He makes this fascinating comparison between humans and animals. He argues that because animals lack reason, their communication is completely genuine. They don't have the ability to construct these like elaborate facades that we humans hide behind. So our capacity for reason, which is supposed to be what sets us apart, is also the thing that allows us to like deceive and create these superficial personas. Right. He says our everyday conversations are filled with all these meaningless platitudes, these empty exchanges that lack real depth. It's like when you're talking to someone and oh. you can just feel that you're not really connecting, like two ships passing in the night. And Schopenhauer would say that's because, deep down, we're not truly trying to understand each other. We're too caught up in our own heads. It makes you wonder if true connection, where you feel truly seen and heard, is even possible when we're all so internally focused. It's something he grapples with a lot in his work. And while Schopenhauer isn't exactly like a ray of sunshine when it comes to human nature, he does offer some guidance on how to navigate this whole messy world. Okay, so what's the solution? How do we break free from this self-absorption and find some peace? Well, Schopenhauer talks about the importance of resignation. And I don't mean giving up on life entirely, but rather letting go of the illusion that we can control everything, that the world should bend to our will. It's about accepting our limitations, our flaws, and the things we simply can't change. So finding contentment with what is, rather than constantly chasing after something more or something better. Exactly. Schopenhauer believed that this constant striving, this insatiable desire for more, is actually the root of our unhappiness. He uses this analogy, it's kind of out there, of a bear in a fable. The bear tries to swat a fly off a hermit's nose with a stone, but ends up injuring the hermit instead. Ouch. A bit harsh, but I get the point. It's like we're so focused on fixing one small thing that we create a bigger problem in the process. Exactly. He suggests that a more fulfilling path is to focus on what brings us joy, what truly fulfills us, and to release the need to control every little thing. So it's a shift in mindset, choosing to like water the flowers instead of obsessing over the weeds. I like that. And Schopenhauer believed that this kind of self-awareness, this acceptance of our own nature, is essential for finding genuine inner peace. It's about understanding ourselves, accepting ourselves, and then having the courage to actually live that truth, even when it's hard. Beautifully put. But as you might imagine, Schopenhauer doesn't sugarcoat the challenges. He was really aware of how much pressure society puts on us to value things like wealth, status, achievement. He even suggests we use these external markers of success as substitutes for actual worth. Yeah. Right? Like a way to validate ourselves. Yeah, it's kind of a cynical take, but you see it everywhere. Think about how much emphasis we put on titles, awards, material possessions. We're constantly comparing ourselves to others, trying to keep up with the Joneses. Social media hasn't helped with that, has it? Not at all. And Schopenhauer would say this kind of comparison is toxic. It just breeds envy, discontent, this feeling of never being good enough. So how do we escape that trap? How do we learn to value ourselves for who we are, not what we have or what others think? It's a lifelong journey, and Schopenhauer doesn't pretend to have all the answers, but he suggests it starts with self-knowledge, honestly acknowledging our strengths and our weaknesses, and accepting that, as he puts it, we're all just 
luckless beings, fighters, and gladiators in the arena of life. That's uh, intense. Not exactly a pep talk, is it? He's not one for sugarcoating, that's for sure. Yeah. But there's something refreshing about his honesty, wouldn't you say? Cool. I suppose so. He's not shying away from the realities of being human. And maybe there's a freedom in that, in acknowledging the struggle. He believed that by embracing our limitations, by recognizing how absurd life can be, we could actually find a deeper sense of peace. It's like he's saying, look, life is tough, but we're all in this together. Exactly. And there's a weird comfort in that shared experience. It's definitely a different way of looking at things. That's the thing about Schopenhauer. He forces us to question our assumptions, to look beyond the surface. He wants us to figure out our own path to truth and happiness. This deep dive has been quite the ride. I'm not sure I agree with everything he says, but I can't deny how much his ideas make me think. That's the mark of a true philosopher, isn't it? He doesn't hand you the answers, he makes you ask the questions. Questions that stay with you long after you've finished reading. And Schopenhauer definitely knew how to ask those thought-provoking questions. But for now, we need to take a quick break. When we come back, we have one final insight from Schopenhauer to unpack. Don't go anywhere. So before the break, we were really getting into Schopenhauer's, uh, well, kind of bleak take on how self-absorbed we can be as humans. Yeah, he definitely encouraged a lot of self-reflection, didn't he? But even within that, like, somewhat pessimistic view of human nature, he does offer a glimmer of hope. There's this one idea that really stood out to me, finding a sense of unity within ourselves. Right. He talks about how hard it can be to actually feel whole when we've got all these different desires and impulses pulling us in different directions. Like we're constantly at war with ourselves, trying to reconcile all the different parts of our personality. The saint, the sinner, the thinker, the doer, all vying for control. He even compares it to this, like mythical hydra cut off one head and two more grow back in its place. It's that vivid analogy he uses, right? About the monster whose head keeps growing back. Talk about an uphill battle. And Schopenhauer's point is, instead of trying to silence those conflicting voices completely, we should try to understand them. He says the key is figuring out which part of ourselves suffers the most when it loses and then letting that part guide our choices. So it's less about finding perfect balance and more about like really knowing our values, even if it means making tough choices. Exactly. He believed that's where true character comes from, making that conscious decision to align our actions with our deepest beliefs, even when it's hard. And he doesn't shy away from the fact that this whole battle of life thing, as he calls it, isn't easy. He even says achieving this level of self-mastery requires a certain amount of like bloodshed, metaphorically speaking, of course. Okay, intense. But I think I get it. Like, living a meaningful life means there's going to be internal conflict, compromise. It's part of the deal. Mm, right. It's about recognizing we can't always get what we want, but we can try to live in a way that feels true to who we are. And Schopenhauer believed that embracing that struggle, accepting our imperfections, that's essential for finding any kind of peace, both within ourselves and in the world. It's kind of like that idea of radical acceptance, right? Like, Embracing all parts of ourselves, the good, the bad, the mess, and all. You nailed it. He'd say that kind of self-awareness is crucial if you want to live authentically, to really become the best version of yourself, even when the world's trying to shove you into a box. This has been quite the deep dive. Schopenhauer definitely makes you think, even if you don't always agree with him. There's something about his honesty, the way he tackles these big questions head on, it's refreshing. He pushes us to really confront ourselves, flaws and all, and maybe in doing that, we find a better way to live, a more fulfilling way to be. So as we wrap up this exploration of Schopenhauer's ideas, what's one thing you hope our listeners take away from it all? Hmm, that's a good question. I think the biggest takeaway is this. What if we approached our conversations, our relationships, even just our interactions with each other, with less of a focus on winning or being right? What if instead we really tried to understand each other, to listen with empathy and an open mind? I think that's something worth thinking about. It really is. That's a powerful thought to leave us with. And on that note, we'll wrap up this deep dive into the world of Arthur Schopenhauer. Thanks for joining us as we explore logic, art, and the complexities of human nature. Until next time, keep those minds curious and those conversations flowing.